Welcome to the endocrine system. In this tutorial, I'll review the function and histology of the pituitary gland. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, the histology wizard. I covered the basics of endocrine signaling in a previous video, so feel free to check it out if you need a review. The pituitary gland is a small bean-shaped gland about the size of a pea, and it's located at the base of the brain. The pituitary, or the hypothesis, is a major endocrine organ that links the nervous system, more specifically the hypothalamus, to the endocrine system. And in fact, the pituitary is also considered the master gland. But more precisely, the pituitary is part of a master pair. It works with the hypothalamus to which it's connected. And together, they form the hypothalamo-hypophysial system, or the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which is much easier to say. The connections between these two glands enable signals from the internal and external environments to regulate hormone secretion from the pituitary. And as shown in this cartoon, these pituitary hormones control the activity of a number of other endocrine glands, and thus are responsible either directly or indirectly for regulating growth, reproduction, ion and water balance, and metabolism. Now the pituitary has two distinct components, or lobes. The glandular anterior pituitary also called the adenohypophysis, comprises about 80% of the pituitary gland. And this anterior pituitary is subdivided into the pars distalis, sometimes called the pars anterior, the pars intermedia, and the pars tuberalis. The neurohypophysis, or posterior pituitary, comprises the other 25 to 20% 20 of the gland. It's subdivided into the large pars nervosa, sometimes called the posterior pituitary, and a smaller stalk or infundibulum which is attached to the hypothalamus. And these two lobes are joined into a single gland that's covered with a dense connective tissue capsule. Interestingly, the pituitary has two embryonic origins, and this will be reflected in the histology. The anterior pituitary arises as an outgrowth of oral ectoderm, so this is essentially the lining of the roof of the mouth. And this is known as Rathke's pouch. So this will subsequently detach thickened to become the pars distalis, and the pars intermedia and the tuberalis are also of ectodermal origin. In contrast, the posterior pituitary arises as a downgrowth from the floor of the diencephalon, so this is neuroectoderm, and it remains attached to the brain, and more specifically, it remains attached to the hypothalamus via the infundibulum. So here at the end, we have the anterior and the posterior lobe. Now let's take a minute to talk about the hypothalamus in relation to the pituitary gland by using this diagram. The two glands are connected both physically and functionally by neural and vascular pathways, and it's through the connections that the nervous system and the endocrine system are integrated and coordinated. So this is a, a pretty simplified view, but essentially the hypothalamus is going to receive input from the external and internal environment and from other brain regions, and it integrates it. And this stimulates an endocrine response, either by secreting, releasing, and inhibitory factors or hormones that regulate anterior pituitary secretion, or by secreting hormones directly. And almost all secretion of pituitary hormones is controlled by these hormonal and neural signals. An important distinguishing functional feature of the pituitary gland is its blood supply. This gland is richly vascularized by the superior and inferior hypophysial arteries, which give rise to the hypophysial portal system and to the capillaries in the pars nervosa. Now recall that a portal system consists of a primary capillary plexus, in this case that's in the infundibulum, and a second capillary plexus in the pars distalis. And these two plexi are connected by long hypophysial portal veins. So let's take a quick look at how this works. Hypothalamic releasing factors, or inhibitory factors, are released from the hypothalamus and they enter the portal system and they reach their target cells in the pars distalis and they stimulate or inhibit production and release of specific pituitary hormones and then those pituitary hormones are released into the blood. The pars nervosa has an additional capillary plexus which is connected to the pars distalis. Hypothalamic hormones are then produced in the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei. These are stored and released to the blood in the pars nervosa. Now let's take a look at some histological sections of the pituitary before we discuss each lobe in more detail. In this H&E stain, you can appreciate the more cellular pars distalis on the left 
and the pars nervosa with its nervous tissue on the right, again reflecting their different origins. The section also shows the pars tuberalis and the isthmus or infundibulum quite well. Here are a couple more sections. In the top panel you can see the differences between the pars distalis and the pars nervosa, and this slide also illustrates the difficulty in distinguishing that pars intermedia. This lower image has an even better view of the infundibulum, and that black arrow shows a portal vessel within this area. So let's take a little quiz. Locate the hypothalamus in this image. Well, it's up here on the right. How about the pars distalis? If you said this darker staining more cellular area, you'd be correct. And finally, what about the pars nervosa? Well, here it is over here on the right. Note the less cellular nervous tissue. You also can appreciate the infundibulum in this section. Now the anterior pituitary gland consists of the pars distalis, the pars intermedia, and the tuberalis, all of which secrete hormones, but the most critical ones are produced in the pars distalis. The cells in this anterior pituitary produce peptide hormones, so they have a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum and secretory granules. These were originally classified as acidophils, basophils, and chromophobes based on color, but more recent studies have shown that there are at least six hormones produced by five different cell types. Most of these are tropins that regulate the function of other endocrine cells, including cells in the thyroid, the gonads, and the adrenal cortex. These are growth hormone, or somatotropin, prolactin, thyroid-stimulating hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, and adrenocorticotropic hormone. And these hormones all regulate reproduction, growth, metabolism, ion balance, etc., and control of their secretion is complex. So now let's look at the histology. In this H and E stain section, you can appreciate the acidophils, the basophils, and the paler staining chromophobes. In addition, take note here of the extensive capillaries, most of which are fenestrated to facilitate release of hormones into the blood. Now the posterior pituitary gland does not produce hormones. Instead, hormones produced in the paraventricular and supraoptic nuclei are produce oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone respectively. And the axons from these neurons form the hypothalamohypophysial tract that runs through the infundibulum and terminates in the capillary plexus. And the hormones are going to be stored in secretory granules in the axon terminals in that pars nervosa and then they'll be released by nerve impulses originating in those hypothalamic nuclei. So what exactly do these hormones do? Well, antidiuretic hormone controls water balance in the body, acting to concentrate urine by increasing permeability of collecting tubules to water via aquaporins. And its secretion is triggered by changes in the osmolarity of body fluids and blood volume. Oxytocin causes contraction of uterine smooth muscle at childbirth and during orgasm, and targets myoepithelial cells in mammary glands that will assist in milk letdown. So here's a section of pars nervosa. Now remember that pars nervosa develops as a downgrowth from the diencephalon. So this is nervous tissue. And you can see in the contrast to the more cellular pars distalis on the right. Specifically, those unmyelinated axons of the hypothalamic nuclei and their terminals are going to form the bulk of the parenchyma of the pars nervosa. So remember, there are no neuronal cell bodies present. Instead, the remainder of the lobe, so around 25% of it, consists of glial cells, and these are called pituocytes, which are related to astrocytes. And again, note the lack of secretory cells in the pars nervosa. With the yellow arrow, you can also see a remnant of Rathke's pouch and a tiny bit of the pars intermedia. So here's a more magnified view of the pars nervosa tissue, where you can see the nuclei of pituocytes. And circled in blue is a herring body or a neurosecretory body. These are essentially the swellings of the axon terminals that store ADH and oxytocin. I'd like to finish today by briefly mentioning some pituitary disorders. Benign pituitary adenomas are common and they're likely to be clonal. And although benign, these adenomas can cause problems if they get large enough. So most of, this most of the issues are going to result from secretion of excess hormone, 
and which hormone is expressed depends upon which cell types are affected. The example given here is a prolactinoma, a common adenoma, and this can produce inappropriate milk production in women and other issues in men. These tumors can also have mass effects, so they can compress brain structures, most notably the optic nerve, due to its close location to the pituitary gland, but also headaches. Disorders of the posterior pituitary usually involve ADH. So for example, overproduction of ADH can lead to retention of solute-free water, or hyponatremia. And this is again because it involves the actions of aquaporins. Hyposecretion of ADH leads to the inability to concentrate urine, and this is called central diabetes insipidus, and it can cause extreme dehydration. I'll leave you with this summary slide highlighting all the pituitary hormones, their targets, and effects. For more on the endocrine system, check out the tutorial on the adrenal glands. And thanks for stopping by.